Okay, so it looks to me like we have a good gathering. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Very big welcome to you all. My name is Shireen and I am the person who has been emailing you and posting about this event. So I know that a lot of you already know what LIDC is, otherwise why would you have joined us? Um, but I'm just to get, gonna do a quick recap and go over a little bit about the format today. So as you probably know, LIDC was founded in 2007 by a number of Bloomsbury colleges. And the reason we were found is to bring people out of their silos and across disciplines to work together in um, tackling seemingly intractable challenges in the global development landscape. And we do this through a variety of ways, obviously through events and public engagement, um, social media, we run training courses, we have um, a course in evaluation, which is coming up in December, so that will go on our website soon. Um, we organize networking and training sessions. Um, we do newsletters. We run events for our student members. We provide internships in digital media and a number of other things. Um, so welcome. Yes, we are very happy to have you joining us today. And we are particularly grateful to have colleagues who've given off their time to share their experience of working in the global development landscape. So you will already know who the speakers are. Um, I will introduce them briefly in order. Um, and then the floor will be yours. So we will encourage you to ask questions. Um, there should be a raised hand function that you should be able to use. And if you don't want to put your camera on, you don't have to. We've organized it as a meeting rather than a webinar because we'd like to see your faces on this occasion. And also just so that you know that you are encouraged to be relaxed, informal, feel free to have your questions answered. This is being recorded and we will post it on our website, so do bear that in mind. Um, if you want to put your question or your contribution in the chat, you can go ahead and do that too. Um, so just a quick word about the term development. We are London International Development Centre. It is a contested term. I'm a Sierra Leonean, so I have feelings about that word. Um, we need a better term, really. Basically, when we talk about development, we mean access to power, social justice. So please bear in mind that when I use the term development, I do so um, with very strong inverted commas. I um, have a number of colleagues with me today. Very grateful to have you all with us. Um, before Moving on, I think one thing that I haven't said is that we were founded by a number of Bloomsbury Colleges, but we've since expanded so that we have um, organisations like Oxfam, WaterAid, obviously the Brook, wonderful SciDevNet journal, which if you haven't used it, use it, they're brilliant. Um, so that's pretty much all that I'm going to say for now. I'm going to hand over very soon to Dr. Alina Pellic. Have I pronounced your name correctly, Doctor? Almost. <laughs> Do you want to correct me now? I take correction. <laughs> no, it's Alina Pellic. So it's Pellic. Just, yeah. I'm very sorry, Pellic. Thank you. Um, Senior Research Fellow in Demography at the UCL Centre for Longitudinal Studies. Dr. Palik was awarded an Understanding Society Fellowship to investigate the role of early adolescent experiences um, in explaining differences in school to work trajectories between siblings. Um, she's previously worked with the Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex. She received an ESRC, an Advanced Quantitative Methods Scholarship, for her PhD research, which she completed at the University of Liverpool in 2019. And her work has featured widely in the media, but I'm sure she'll tell you more about herself and how she came to do what she's doing now. So with no further ado, it's over to you, Dr. Palik. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, I can see 10 people in the waiting room. Should we admit them all? 
thank you. Um, I did think I'd ask people to help with that. But yes, I've gone ahead and done that now. Thank you so much. I, I'll, I'll keep the participants list open so I can keep an eye on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's all in now. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now and you should see my presentation. So I'm just going to talk about, you know, my career, who am I, who is a demographer, what does a demographer do, what does it have to do with development, um, and also kind of how did I end up being um, an academic, and this is something that doesn't come naturally to everyone or not something that I ever planned, probably. So I am a senior research fellow, and what does it mean in academic terms? So I am basically a lecturer, but I don't do teaching as part of my kind of day-to-day -day job. I do teaching on site and I'm mostly paid by the university to do research. So that's the only difference between me and the lecturer. Um, and I'm based at the Center for Longitudinal Studies. And you, if you've not heard about it or don't know what longitudinal study is, so there are a number of cohort studies in the UK that collect information on uh, participants from birth. So those are, for example, people born in 1958, 1970, um, in 2000, and then the data is collected over the course of the year. So you basically have thousands of people about who you know absolutely everything from the moment they're born um, and until they die. And this is very powerful because if we want to study social inequalities, if we want to study, say, gender inequality or transmission of inequalities um, from parents to children, you need this kind of data to have the comprehensive understanding of um, societal development. And um, a bit more about what I do is I've joined, um, so I'm a quantitative social demographer, and um, so I'm a social scientist essentially, and I do quantitative research. So I mostly use secondary data analysis like administrative data, for example, birth certificates or large survey data. So as something that I mentioned before, those surveys that have thousands of people in and capture various information about them from when they left the parental home, what, what is their health status, what are their political alliances and uh, uh, all around it. So I mostly work at the intersection of family demography um, so I study families, how have families changed, what is a family, um, reproductive epidemiology, so I do research about assisted reproduction, um, and assisted reproduction um, is kind of a relatively new technique like IVF that's only been introduced in the 1978, um, and we study um, the health of children, the outcomes for parents, because it could be a very you know, problematic and psychological process. Um, and how it all affects social policy. So I joined UCL in, so I start from backwards and say a little bit about like what, you know, yeah, the, about my, the recent development. So I joined UCL in 2020, just before the pandemic, the lucky one to meet my colleagues in person and then um, to disappear from, from the radar for two years. Um, and I started as a postdoc, so as a, or it's called at UCL a research fellow. So when you see um, different job titles like research fellow, senior research officer, research officer, uh, you shouldn't be put off by the by the login senior in it because it just means different if universities have different tags for um, how the position is called. So that shouldn't put you off if you don't think, oh, I'm not senior, I'm, I'm very junior. That, that does not apply to how junior or senior you are. Um, well, in this case, I studied as a research fellow, and, number, uh, and now I'm a senior research fellow, but it's only because there is a term research fellow, so that's why I had, you know, that shows a career progression. Um, and uh, yes, as, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I, so I do research on medically assisted reproduction, as I've just said, and also have some of my own studies. Um, the fellowship where I look at siblings from so siblings from same families and how um, the decisions of what they do post 16, how it has been affected by family background um, and individual characteristics, including mental health and family perceived family support, for example. Um, I also do a lot of um, work in terms of for equality, uh, for equality and diversity and inclusion. 
and I organize early career network and I promote um, transparency in academia. And uh, um, also something that might be of use for you is they, um, together with a few colleagues during the pandemic, we thought that um, that's the time when we particularly lack networks and we particularly lack just going for coffees and meeting new people. And we studied a podcast in which we talk about various challenges that early career academics meet from um, the sense of community and diversity in academia, job security, um, and the recent season we did about careers outside of academia. So for example, um, civil service, uh, Office for National Statistics, for example, um, or Duolingo or you know, any um, um, kind of outside of academia um, resources. And uh, the next season in particular, we're going to focus on skills that could be helpful for students and in, including, po you know, including PhD students um, in finding a job and understanding what the profession is about. And uh, we got some funding from doctoral school. So we will be particularly theming around um, job market, navigating career and kind of this transition from being a student to um, establishing yourself in academia. Um, so before that, I used to work in Essex and I was a senior research officer. And this is why I said, you know, senior, non-senior, because I was just finishing my PhD back in the day. And if my friend didn't push me to say, look, senior research officer doesn't mean they look for a senior person. It's just how it is called in Essex. Um, I wouldn't have applied for this job. I would thought like, no, they're looking for someone senior and I'm just finishing my PhD. So it's not about me. Um, so I worked in the policy unit of um, Understanding Society and Understanding Society is another large um, UK wide household panel data. So I used, um, I worked with various government departments that fund this study in, in order to do some research for them. So basically anything goes from teaching them how to use variables to understanding the analysis, to doing some quick analysis on say how job satisfaction in Scotland has changed over time. Um, to something bigger, like a project with the Government Equalities Office, which I really enjoyed and liked because you could think how you make a difference. And this project was looking at employment um, pathways and career progression after childbirth in men and women in the UK. And we showed who comes back to work, who doesn't, and how it contributes to gender pay gap. Um, and this is, you know, when you do work like that, policy relevant work, and when you have kind of an outcome in it, um, it is a very powerful feeling and it is a feeling that you can make a difference with baby steps. Unfortunately, it came out, um, this report came out shortly before the general election 2019. And then all of the immediate attention that we got obviously got overblown with general election, but that happens in life as well. Um, but it was a useful experience to talk to um, journalists, my first experience of talking to journalists and to uh, TV presenters about, about this research. And it teaches you how to talk about research, how to be careful in terms of what you say and how um, how to make sure that your findings are not being misinterpreted. Um, because journalists like flashy uh, headlines and sometimes that's not what we do in academia. Um, also what I wanted to say is, you know, so I've already shown like that I do some different kind of uh, research on family health, but also on career progression. Um, my PhD was actually completely, not to say completely different, but um, it was about transition to adulthood in England and Wales. So I looked at how um, three domains of life, if you could say so in jargon terms, in demography jargon terms, have changed over um, the last 25 years. So I looked how leaving the parental home and then you know moving um, over short or long distance have changed. I looked up in, um, I analyzed the first co-residential partnership formation, so your first part partnership formation, and how it changed again, and that has also attracted a lot of media attention, and um, it was great to talk about in general about what we observe and the complexity of um, transition to labor market, which I'm sure all of you are very well aware of, and we need more evidence to kind of to highlight those, uh, those differences and uh, highlight how um, much more complicated those processes have become. Um, what I did during my PhD, and I don't know actually like whether all of you at which level are you, whether you finish in your undergraduate or considering a master's or considering a PhD or something else, but 
because my PhD was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, um, there was an opportunity to either do a placement for four months or an internship. And I chose, um, well, I have choice, I applied to, <laughs> it's not a choice. Um, no one pushes you to do anything unless you, you know, you do it yourself. Um, but I chose to get an international experience at the United Nations Economic Commission um, of Europe for Europe, so UNEC. And um, I worked in the statistics division for four months. So I was involved in a range of different projects, including summarizing some of the work that they've been doing on poverty measurements. Um, then I was producing some kind of short journalist articles using the um, the data that they collect um, on various topics, for example, the number of journalists across the country, how does it how has it changed in the last thirty years, and how um, how does it uh, uh, how men and women compare in it? So very very different things, but basically what this did is um, it taught me to a see that the skills that you obtain during your education are very transferable and if i wanted to stay and work at the u at the un it would be very possible um i've learned to see the international perspective on development and how some of the decisions are being made and i've attended some of the meetings with chief statisticians of the various countries and um, and to see the rhetoric that they bring up and a lot of it is even though we were talking about statistics um a lot of it is very political and you see how the decisions are being made and you see how, um, I don't know, that is all very real, I guess. So I think when I was a student, organizations like UN, World Health Organization, International Labor Organization were just, um, you know, multiple letters, like abbreviations for me. I didn't really believe that you can get an internship there without, um, you know, just, just, just as part of your studies. And uh, of course, it's a very privileged position, and part of the pro problem is that um, those internships are usually unpaid, and I don't know whether it changed recently, but back in the day, it was only the international labor organizations who were paying their interns. Um, well, it would be laughable if they weren't, right? They are the international labor organization, cool if not them. Um, so it ob honestly, obviously, it was promoting the diversity and inclusion, but who were there only... PhD students and other students from rich countries and countries that have international funds to support it. For example, Germany has multiple um, charity organizations that um, and funds to, to get an internship at the UN for longer terms, like a, like a secondment for 12 months. Um, and of course, this is something that you know you, you see in real life and you think about all the inequalities that um, I don't know that we talk about and how they've been, uh, um, you know, who gets to work at those kind of organizations and depending on where they're based on. I think I've been talking for quite a while now. I think I just wanted to say um, a few other things that might be helpful for you. So I graduated from the European Doctoral School of Demography. And um, this is a, a doctoral school of demography. You don't have to go into PhD after it, but um, to be eligible, the applicant should hold a master degree or be near, um, near completion of masters. And this is a, a fantastic program if you want to learn more about population studies and very different aspects from causes and consequences of demographic change to statistical demography to all of this stuff that will be helpful if you want to go and work in the international organization, study in development and population um, and you know how it all uh, brings together. And this is a, a funded opportunity. So um, all of my studies were always funded. So I uh, um, never had the luxury of just, just getting a degree for the sake of getting a degree. Um, so it's, and it's, it's, it's great because they don't ask for anything in, you know, in return. So you have to apply for it, but it's 11 months funded, um, program that helps you to land a PhD afterwards. I wasn't enrolled in a PhD program when I started it and, uh, the school moves every two years. So when I was doing it, it was in Warsaw and then I moved to Barcelona, to Rome, um, at the moment it's in Paris and then it's moving back to Barcelona. So um, it's, you know, it's an opportunity to study in a cool place as well. Um, but I think like what I wanted to say is that I wasn't planning many of the things that happened to me in life and some things just happen. And if you, you know, yeah, it's probably sounds very banal, but you have to, to go for the opportunity if, if one is presented. And uh, of course, the labor market conditions are 
changing dramatically now and you know this was some some of the things that I study um and obviously you're not they're put in a very easy position in terms of finding um finding a job and continuing your education um but if you're interested in anything remotely related to population studies then we also teach a bunch of programs at UCL and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about my career path and choices and um kind of how, uh, yeah, how I interpret my choices and uh, how much of it was a really a choice. Um, so I, I don't know, I hope that I met the uh, um, the goals of this session. Uh, not really sure, but I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, later on if you have any. Sorry for the delay. I was actually making notes as you were talking. Thank you so much for that very informative session. Um, we will take um, questions after all the speakers have presented, but just while I have the chair's prerogative, there were a couple of things that you said that I wanted to pick up on. Um, and the, the first thing was when you said about um, being a senior person, that if someone hadn't spoken to you, you would have had this image in your head of what that means. And I know, for example, with me, um, all of the studies that I did, all of my degrees were all because people asked me why I didn't. But I grew up thinking that, you know, I know I've got this voice, but I grew up in Sierra Leone in West Africa. And somehow I grew up thinking, well, I'm not going to work in a university. I'm not going to be in academia. I'm not going to do this. I'm... So I just excluded myself before I was even excluded. It was people saying, why don't you do this? that made me do things that I've done. Um, so I think that's so important that we continue having conversations, but also talking to people. When I say behind, I don't mean necessarily younger, older people, just other people lifting each other up. So I just wanted to make that point before I forget it. The other thing that you said was about funding. Um, when I send out newsletters, I look for funded PhDs. I've never done anything that was funded. I just, it, you know, I think I was I was well into my 50s before I paid off the student loan for my first degree. So look for funding people. There are opportunities out there. And the other thing that you said was about life throwing things at you. Um, I never intended to work in a refugee camp, but I was in a country and war broke out and useful experience. So we are going to go over now to um, Greg, who I've actually lost. I've got so many things open that I've actually lost my introduction to you. But fortunately, okay. I had the great pleasure of meeting Greg when LIDC was based in another organization. And he came along to join an organization called SEDEP. And he will tell us what that is. It's part of SOAS. I know you all know what SOAS is. And you will have read his biography. So you will know that he is with the University of Sheffield and that he works very closely with us um, on the Action Against Stunting Hub. So see, I do know things about people. Um, Greg, I'm gonna actually just leave it there because I need to be aware of time. And this isn't all about me and who I know and what I know. And with very great pleasure, Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, unlike uh, Dr. Alina, I don't have slides. So I'll I just talk and I'll keep it uh, brief. Um, yeah, thank you, Shereen. I remember meeting you back in 2018 when I was super nervous before that job interview. And yeah, you were great, you were there. And suddenly my nerves dissipated. So that was a long time ago now. Um, so yeah, I'm Greg. I'm a uh, postdoc research uh, associate, postdoctoral research associate at the University of Sheffield. And um, we were talking, Alina was talking about different names. So at Sheffield, they don't use research fellow unless you're bought in something like Leverhulme funding. Uh, so I'm part of a, a number of projects. So we use the term research associate. And uh, at the University of Sheffield, I'm part of the Department of Geography. And I'm also part of one of the flagship research institutes uh, at the university called the Institute for Sustainable Food, which brings together people and, and academics and, and students as well from different departments across the university 
to, to understand challenges and, and potential solutions to issues of both national and, and global uh, food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. And really, I was just going to kind of chart my, uh, I guess, career uh, to date. Although it's always funny talking about yourself, you know, it's, it's kind of like doing like a job interview or, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. So really back in school, I was kind of one of the kids who always used to read the atlases and you know, just tried to kind of think about the world and, and where I could travel to. And um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Southampton in physical geography. You know, I was, you know, wanted to understand the kind of the forces which shape the world. Um, but I quickly realized by the time of second year and third year that actually, you know, as humans, particularly in developed countries, developed countries um, are, you know, through pollution and their contributions to climate change, environmental issues, you know, we're as much of a force um, on the world as, as you know, rivers and glaciers and, and volcanoes. And it was in the third year um, of my undergraduate, I did a course called Complex Social Ecological Systems. So looking at how you know, ecosystems and, and then the kind of societies and economics, how they interact and ideas of environmental sustainability and um, social ecological resilience and robustness. Some of these ideas really captured my imagination. Um, and I was really fortunate, basically, kind of a key theme of my, I guess, career to date, I think is, is kind of like a little bit of luck, really. I guess you all have a little bit of luck. But um, I, I happened to bump into the lecturer of this module um, in a corridor. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to you know, thank him for the grade and, and just have a discussion about the course. He mentioned there was a, a PhD opportunity um, doing very similar similar things. It was known as the, the DECMA project. So it was Deltas, Climate Change, Migration and Adaptation. It was working in India, in Ghana, and in Bangladesh. And uh, he said, you know, I thought about applying for this, this position. I didn't really know what a PhD was <laughs> at that point, to be honest. Um, I then applied and, and was really fortunate to, to get this PhD position. And to be honest, if I hadn't stopped the lecturer in the corridor, I would, I would probably not be on this call today. That's, it's, that's genuinely uh, the truth. I, I really didn't know what a PhD was at that point. Um, so yeah, I was then really, really fortunate to do a, a three-year PhD from the University of Southampton in the Department of Geography. Working on the DECMA project, I uh, went to, uh, to India, to the state of Orissa. In Orissa, there is a, 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 a lagoon, um, Lake Chilica. And you know it's experienced environmental problems uh, over the last few decades. There's worries around overfishing and and, and resource use. I was super fortunate in 2016 to spend two months in India. Um, as people like Dinesh, who's on this call, Shaleen, uh, Chelsea, they know I've kind of fallen in love with with the place ever since, and um, I spent a lot of time here ever since, and super lucky to do so. Um, I think Sheffield is uh, are keen for me to spend more time in Sheffield, but. I'm actually writing, I'm in Hyderabad at the moment. Um, so I did my PhD in, in geography um, from 2014 to 2018. And then I applied for postdocs. Um, you know, I, at that point, I realized I wanted to stay in academia. The, the ability to kind of get up every morning or the, 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 the kind of fortunate position or the privileged position to get up every morning and study something which I felt passionate about and enjoyed. Um, and I appreciate that not everybody has that PhD experience. I was very lucky to have extremely supportive um, supervisors. And um, I was applying for postdocs and, and, you know, I was rejected from a couple. Um, but then, then I met Shireen at this, uh, this interview when I applied for a position at the uh, Center for Development, Environment and Policy at SOAS. And it was with Professor Bhavani Shankar. Um, and he is an agroeconomist. Agro works on issues of food security, particularly in, in South Asia and India and Bangladesh. And um, again, that led me back out to, to India, to the northern state of Bihar, working on essentially agricultural value chains, working with an NGO uh, in, in Bihar uh, called uh, Digital Green, who worked to aggregate the produce of smallholder farmers uh, by kind of providing the, log the, log the logistics and the, uh, the technology to enable farmers to come together and transport their produce to the market, enabling people to save time and, and access better prices and so on. Um, so I was working as a postdoc on, on that project for, for two years and then COVID happened and, and we had a, a no cost extension, which allowed us the project um, to, to extend for another year. 
And I, I mentioned earlier about kind of strokes of luck. Um, yeah, that then took me to 2021, and there was then an opening on the action against hunting hub. So if I had to leave the previous project, the, the mini project, market intervention for nutritional improvement, that's so as if I had to leave that project in 2020, then I would probably have not have been a part of the action against stunting hub, uh, which Chelsea's a part of, and a number of uh, colleagues on this call is a part of. Uh, and I, again, I work on, on food systems, particularly uh, in Lombok, in, in Indonesia, and uh, in, in Hyderabad, uh, here in India. And since then, uh, just for the last couple of minutes, since then, I've been really, really fortunate to have a supervisor like Bhavani, essentially, who is excellent at, at bringing funding, essentially. Uh, and I've been fortunate to be part of those projects and some of his grant uh, successes. So we've just started a new five-year project uh, known as Indian Food Systems for Improved Nutrition. And it's working with the government of Bihar in Northern India. It's a five-year project. And for a, to, to be a postdoc with five years, uh, you know, a job for five years is, is incredible, like incredible privilege. Um, and also then working with the University of Ghana, uh, we won a small grant um, called, the, called NutriShed, which is, again, is kind of mapping uh, the, the kind of nutrient components of, of agricultural value, value chains. And that's from the Innovative Methods Metrics uh, for Agriculture, Nutrition, Action, Amana, uh, the, the funding body there. Um, so, yeah, that's just a really, I've, I'm essentially just a geographer who then, you know, moved into more social ecological systems and then onwards onto kind of agriculture and food systems. So just for the last 20 seconds or so, just some of the challenges, I guess, of this, uh, I, I consider myself to be a bit of a generalist that I, I work across multiple projects, but sometimes I get a bit jealous if there's a specialist on the project and I think, oh, maybe I would like to know a bit more about that methodology or maybe I should, I should know more about that. And perhaps I can do many things at a reasonable level some people are real specialists. So as you kind of think about going forwards, if you have a particular methodology or a particular part of the world or, or concept that you're particularly interested in, you may want to consider, you know, really focusing on that. That's a bit of a debate. Challenges of being across multiple projects. I'm super lucky to be able to travel with this work and be part of different teams and different projects. But, you know, being part of three projects also is quite difficult to balance in, in terms of sorting out, you know, what to do for the week or for the month. Um, just to say, just, just to encourage you all, and I appreciate it's not always easy. I've been super lucky in terms of the supervisors I've had and the relationships I've had with them. Um, but you'll know when you have a good supervisor and often they'll, you know, carry, carry you along with them and, and encourage you and, and provide those opportunities. That was the quickest nine minutes of my life. So I'd best hold it there, um, give Valentina and give Chelsea a chance to talk. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I will say, actually, Greg, I could listen to you all day. I find you, okay. you know, if it's someone who's so incredibly intelligent and who's done all the things that you've done, you're so approachable and so humble. And um, yeah, your voice, you've just got a nice voice. I think you should look wow. at doing audio books as a side hustle because I could really like, oh, anyway, oh, like I said, me. <laughs> not about me is it uh right but yeah this is a perk of my job I I love events like this where you get to you know learn more about people that you work with and find out how they've ended up doing what they do so um over shortly to my good friend Chelsea um I'm so lucky that I get to work with you, Chelsea. I know that public speaking isn't what you think you were born to do, um, but the fact that you were so willing to step up when I went next door and prodded you and wouldn't leave you alone until you agreed, because I know a bit about your story. I know where you started off. I know what you did your master's in, I know where you've lived, I know that you studied in three places and that you then took a casual job with LIDC until you got the job that you wanted with the Action Against Stunting Hub. Um, but you know your story more than me. So with no further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you now so you can tell everyone all about yourself and how you came to be here. Thank you, Chelsea. Well, thank you very much. I made a slideshow 
uh, to demonstrate my very wonky path to where I am now. Uh, so a quick introduction. Thank you, Shireen, very much for that delightful introduction. I'm feeling very hot warm right now. It's a delight to work with you also. Um, so I am Chelsea. I work at the Action Against Stunting Hub as a program coordinator. So what that means is um, I'm not involved in the research. I am the person in the background helping keep the lights on, booking flights, organizing for equipment to be shipped around the world. It's um, potentially a lot less glamorous sounding than being a researcher, but uh, it's another part of the entire operation that keeps things going. And for me, it's quite suited because I like being in the center of things as much as I do not like public speaking. <laughs> so um, for I feel that when I went to school, um, there was an expectation that you start with finishing school and then you take a very straight line and you end up at your career. My reality looked a lot more like this bottom example. So I'm gonna now provide you my, uh, my very wonky path to where I am now, very briefly, I hope. So, ooh, hang on, it stops moving. So um, I started in Australia doing my bachelor in health science, uh, majoring in nutrition at QUT with these two lovely ladies. I was looking for a picture of my university life today and I thought this one sums it up because they are a wonderful support. Um, that was, so during that time, um, I used the opportunity to volunteer to do data collection for my professors at the Vietnamese Children's Festival a couple of times. I got involved in running events at the, at the university that they were putting on. So mostly, you know, setting up chairs or helping people find the rooms and things. Um, I also volunteered in a cooking program called Cooking for One or Two, which was with uh, Veterans, of, Veterans Affairs Australia. Um, and we'd essentially we were teaching uh, recently widowed veterans how to cook and to look after themselves. And also we'd give them, um, you know, demonstrations on how to understand food labels or what to look for in balanced meals. And we just cook together and eat. And it was generally a really lovely time. Um, I met some lifelong friends, being the people in the photo here. And during that time, I, instead of applying to do a local placement over a few months, I applied to do my placement at the Ho Chi Minh Nutrition Center in Vietnam. And I was very lucky to get that. I have very clumsily put some smiley faces over every child of, uh, child's photo here. So please forgive the, uh, the funny faces that are gonna be all through this presentation. Um, so during my placement, we actually did, took the anthrop anthropometric measurements of all of these children. And I got to know these lovely people who I was working with at the nutrition center. We also were helping set up a community garden. And uh, this photo is actually, if I hadn't blocked it out, showing you, we also painted games all over the grounds of the school so that they could you know, have games to play because they didn't have a lot of running around space. It was just concrete. So we were making like hopscotch and all sorts of things. And then I took the natural progression where I didn't know where I wanted to go with that because nutrition, at the time in Australia wasn't really going in the way that I was interested in. It's a lot more focused on, um, you know, also very, very important topics like overweight and obesity and diabetes, but it wasn't what I was passionate in. So instead I naturally went traveling for about 18 months all around the world. Coming back from that, I was absolutely broke and took the first job I got, which was then managing a toy store which was a lot of fun um, and taught me a lot of valuable skills. So I learned as I was the manager, I learned how to manage people. I also learned how to, you know, look after staff as well as the general public and just learned a lot about responsibility. And then I naturally moved to Europe uh, as you do. So when I moved there, I 
lived around, moved around some different countries. I used that opportunity to learn German and also a handful of Dutch. Um, and then while I was living there, I found a master's course that was actually what I was looking to do, which was to work in global health. And so after a couple of years of applying due to not realizing I had to do language tests because it was taught in English, I, oh, sorry, also during that time, I then had to find other ways to sustain myself. So I took a lot of time working in cafes or babysitting or finding any way to use the skills I already had to make further skills and keep myself afloat. And then I found this master's course, which sounded exactly like what I wanted. Firstly, it was in global health. And secondly, it meant I got to travel. So I did my first three months at this beautiful campus in Maastricht University, and then did my next three months in this other beautiful campus, which is Thammasat University in Thailand. And then I went on to do my thesis project in Hyderabad with the IIPH, let's just say IIPHH, sorry, the Indian Institute of Public Health in Hyderabad. Um, and for my uh, research project, I was interviewing women on what they ate during their pregnancy and why. Following this, I couldn't find a job in the sector, so I ended up working doing finance, social media, and operations at a small um, engineering firm, which once again doesn't really sound like it's going to uh, go towards my career goals, but it did teach me about finance and bookkeeping. It gave me an introduction to doing social media for an organization and, you know, generally just helped me learn a lot of office ma management skills. I then found an internship in India. So I went off to India. This took me 18 months after I had graduated to find. Um, so I went off to India and did a project coordinator internship. Um, and during this time, we did things like menstrual hygiene programs. I made a community garden. We launched a few school libraries. I taught English. Um, there was a lot going on at this organization. And there was a lot of hard work, but it taught me so much to do with project coordination and also taught me the valuable lesson that I did not want to be a teacher. And then I got back and there was a pandemic, panic. So what do you do once the whole world shuts down and it's impossible to find a job? Um, so recently back from my internship, I found a, an organization online where I started volunteering called Let's Help International. Let's Help International is based in a refugee camp in Uganda. And with them, I started helping them do grant applications. I'd also hold trainings with the things that I'd learned at university for the other people in the organization so they could learn how to do them too. Um, alongside that, I started doing um, writing as a freelancer. And I went back to working part-time at the engineering firm. And I also made a website and just found different ways that I could work on lots and lots of skills. So once the world opened up again, I could try and find a job. Following this, I went to a, um, a networking event held by the Action Against Stunting Hub in co collaboration with LIDC. And there I had the, uh, the pleasure to meet all sorts of people that were currently working here and went, this is where I want to work. How do I make this happen? So I had a chat to the people at the networking event about, um, you know, the different avenues to get in. And then a few months later, I'd been keeping an eye on their LinkedIn and I saw that they were at LADC were organizing sorry, we're advertising for um, short-term workers. So I thought, well, I'll apply and see what happens. I applied for a three-month position as just a general worker and ended up doing admin coordination and just general whatever was needed and ended up staying with LIDC for a year. 
And from there, I saw a position open with the Action Against Stunting Hub, which was my ultimate goal in all of this. And or when I say in all of this, I mean to get into this sort of position. And then once I heard about the hub, to get into the hub. Um, so then I applied for a position with the Action Against Stunting Hub. I talked to the boss to let her know why I decided to apply for this position so that she could know my motivation as well. Um, and then luckily I got the position and have now been with the hub for uh, going up to a year and a half. And here I am in Rome last week with uh, my colleagues here. So I have a few key points from this entire, um, what I would call a, a roundabout career progression. And that is that it's okay that if your career path is in a straight line and that you take um, detours along the way and that every job you have is still giving you work experience and teaching you valuable lessons. And even if that lesson is, is just teaching you what you don't, want to do in your career because I think that's also a valuable lesson and you can always find ways to work things that you're interested in into the position that you're currently at and as they as was said before try and grasp the opportunities that come your way thank you Sorry, <laughs> apologies. And thank you so much for that, Chelsea. I believe you were born to do a bit more public speaking. I was, yeah, yeah, you started now and you just got to carry on in that trajectory. So um, a number of things that you said there, one of which is don't be shy to ask. Because um, if you hadn't, I wouldn't have you as a colleague now. You wouldn't be in the next room to where I am now. So our final speaker for this afternoon is Valentina Allen. And again, there's another serendipitous story there, because in a roundabout way, the reason we've got to meet Valentina is because she works with somebody called um, Anna Marie, who once worked at Imana that Greg mentioned. Um, in a building that I used to work in. And then Anna Marie went to work um, with The Brook, which is an NGO that um, campaigns for the welfare of working equines. So see how the plan, the cosmic plan all comes together. Valentina joins us today from sunny Scotland. Um, she's head of external affairs at the Brook. Um, its full name is Action for Working Donkeys and Horses. And I will say, actually, we've just rescheduled today a social media post about the report that you guys recently did um, following your parliamentary launch. But anyway, you can talk a bit more about that if you want to. Um, she's a policy and advocacy uh, professional who's been working for the welfare of animals for over 10 years now. If you don't look it. Um, <laughs> and she grew up in Italy and is qualified in law and, get this, linguistics. And now she's Head of External Affairs at The Brook. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm now going to mute myself and hand over to you. Oh, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for this introduction, Shereen, and for inviting me. Um, it's a fantastic forum, so it's uh, really great to be to be part of this. I feel actually that the speakers before me have paved the way. I'm, I'm probably going to be really repetitive because... Uh, there are so many elements and points that I was planning to, to talk about, but they did it for me, which is fantastic. Um, so as Shireen said, I work for Brooke, uh, which is an animal welfare organisation. And uh, the reason we are connected with the international development sector is because we like to say that we are an animal welfare organisation working in the international development bubble. And why? It's because of the animals, essentially, that we um, advocate for, which are working animals, uh, specifically equids, uh, horses, donkeys and mules. Um, these animals are usually 
um, utilize in what what they're called now low and middle income countries. There are so many terms, as Sharin was said, international development being controversial, and you don't really know what to use, but let's use the World Bank definition, low and middle income countries. So working animals are generally used in these countries as working animals. So to in agriculture, to as transportation, uh, for waste management, for uh, collecting water, I mean, literally anything that you can use a, a, an equid for. Um, so Brooke, um, Brooke was established, uh, well, next year will be 90 years, uh, so it's been, it's been there for a while, um, and uh, we have projects in about 15 countries with several offices overseas, so we are based in London, but actually it's only, it's only a small part of the organisation that's based in London, so our HQ, but all everything that we do is overseas in that's why we say it's international development because it's, it's always internationally. Um, how have I landed uh, to this? Um, Chelsea's first slide was actually uh, like staggering because like this resonates so much instead of, you know, one thing about, oh, I'm going from A to B, it's really straightforward and it's absolutely fine, everything organized. And instead you find yourself you know, meandering like a river. Um, which is exactly what, what I did. Um, I have always uh, volunteered uh, for international development organizations and animal welfare organizations, uh, thanks to my parents, essentially. So I was just copying them since I was a child. And it, it's stunning, the fact that I didn't think of studying something related to that. I remember when I finished high school back in Italy, I had no idea what I wanted to do, or I, at least I have an idea. So oh, I want to study law and I want to study languages. What do I do? What do I do? I'm just going to do both, <laughs> which is helpful up to a point, because then you 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 do two things and you you finish university. It's like, mm, what do I do now? Because shall I apply for this job or the other job or another job? Anyway, fast forward. I left Italy um, after uni, uh, moved to France. I'm in France um, as a translator and interpreter working primarily for vet and clinics, so connected to animals, but also with solicitors and lawyers, again, connected to law, specifically European EU law, so European Union, because, again, I've always been interested uh, in, in that. I studied a bit um, connected, I studied something connected with the EU when I was at, when I was at university, and I, obviously you know about the EU, but you don't really know much about these big institutions as Alina was saying you see these acronyms you hear about them in the news you know that they are affecting your life they're shaping uh, the world but you you don't really know and I'm saying this because um, when I was working as a translator I started my uh, my first master again in um, specializing in translation for um, technical translation let me put it this way legal and technical translation and um, we had to do uh, a period as, an, in, as interns in whatever we wanted to do. And by chance, I promise, I cannot remember how, but somebody told me, oh, you know, we, you can apply for internship at the European Union. So I did. And somehow they, um, they offered me a placement. And um, probably compared to EUN internships, of which I'm not really an expert, the EU um, offers paid internships. They're usually five to six months. It depends on the institution. I did it with the European Parliament, uh, but it was paid. It's paid sort of minimum wage, but still it's, it, I, I could survive. I could actually do things. It's not, it was not only, I only have you know, um, my salary to pay the rent of food. We could actually do stuff with my fellow interns. So that was, that was nice. And there are two options every six months. So if you're interested, do check the European Union website. It's all there. I absolutely loved the, the experience. And that internship then ended. And but 10 days later, I was offered a job within the European Parliament. So once you're in, it's way easier to stay if you want to stay. Um, and you also get to know the institution. Again, they seem so uh, they seem in a way like abstract, like institution. What is it? Brussels, what does that mean? Uh, but actually, when you're in, you can you can touch I suppose with your with your hands uh, and your hands in, and understand what they do why they do and how you can be part of it um I work for the institute for the EU uh 
for about six years at the European Parliament, I was a project manager and I was doing community engagement, which is what it is essentially, community engagement. So the EU um, has uh, funds to invite uh, groups uh, of citizens, EU citizens to Brussels and even third countries actually, so that they get to know what the institutions are, what they do, uh, their rights, everything that you, you want to know, especially. So this is what I was doing. I was, I was working mainly with schools, with journalists, uh, depending on, on the country, depending on the group. And I absolutely loved my, my time in the EU, um, at the parliament specifically. Um, sort of by chance, because I was still volunteering um, for animal welfare um, organizations, especially one when I was living in Belgium, because I was living in Brussels at the time, um, I met a um, the animal welfare person, if you want, at the European Commission, who offered me the, a job in his unit. I accepted it, so I moved into proper animal welfare from the policy side, obviously, because I was working for the European Commission and specifically Specifically, I was working on trade agreements. So the EU um, has a number of trade agreements with uh, within the EU itself, but also especially with third countries. And there are so many provisions. So everything that we we, we do, everything that we buy, everything that we eat uh, is regulated. Obviously, if you not in the UK where I live now, but if you live in the EU, as I'm sure you know, um, and trade agreements are long processes to work on. Uh, it takes forever, obviously, because it's about negotiations, it's about uh, money, it's about input and expert. And animal welfare, in this sense, is paramount, like animal health, because it's about what we eat at the end of the day, what, eat, what we put in our stomachs. Um, and I stayed with the, with the uh, commission for about a year. And I was lobbied, obviously, at least once or, uh, or twice per week by NGOs and civil society, rightly so, um, to uh, include in trade agreements provisions for, for example, the protections of animals or for health uh, or for consumers, um, for example, for labeling, you know, you know, to ensure the labels that we stick on our, on our products that we sell are not misleading, things like that. Um, so I got to know uh, that side uh, of the of the sector as well and um, after a year or so I applied for a job with one of these NGOs so I thought okay let's uh, let's be quite, become one of those filthy lobbyists you know who lobby me let's let's jump at the other side so I did um, and um, that was one organization uh, where I was um, I was working as the uh, EU advisor so as I said I was lobbying the EU, so the other side. Um, and fast forward, I changed a couple of organizations and I landed here with Brooke. Um, external Affairs is about advocacy, campaigning and lobbying. So, and I've been doing that for about seven, seven to eight years now. Uh, and this is this is how I landed in my place within the, the international development sector. Um, as you can see, my, my path has been probably quite messy, quite blurred. Um, so what Chelsea was saying, and actually what everybody says, I mean, Greg and, and Alina as well, um, grabbing the opportunity, seizing the day, uh, understanding what you do not want to do, uh, thinking, oh, shall I go for that? Or shall, or shall I go for the other thing? I mean, following your instinct, uh, not being afraid of um, titles, for example, should I apply for that senior position? What does that mean? Yes, I'm going to apply. Not being afraid of approaching people. Um, in, my, in my role, especially in the last uh, three to four years, I've been working closely with the UN. So I usually travel to New York and Rome for about four or five times uh, a year and sometimes it can be a bit daunting especially the first time when you approach the uh, ambassador of x country or the uh, general secretary of something else or the head of the uh, unit of the disaster and risk management at the UN uh, but at the end of the day there are people uh, they're really happy to work with you uh, if you if you're committed if you're a professional um, if you don't talk wishy-washy especially um, and um, they um, they become part of your network and this is about this, this is it it's about connection it's about um, 
it's about people it's about relationship obviously i'm t- i'm talking this way because i'm a policy nerd i'm an external affairs expert but but th- th- this is the point this is, we essentially we get to where we are because we we just jump um when we 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 take leaps, leaps of faith i suppose um and we and we go with our instincts um I think I'm probably going to stop here because I know that we have limited time and you might have uh, questions. I'm hoping, I mean, I hope I've, I've given you uh, sort of a picture of the best picture I, c- I could of my, as I said, blurred career. And I hope this has been helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina. That was brilliant. And um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> that thing that you said about sometimes it can be a bit daunting. And I think we all feel that when you're around these, you know, people that have this sort of what appears to be elevated status. Um, And it, you know, but remember that they probably feel, I imagine half of them probably suffer from imposter syndrome too, but they don't let that stop them from taking those jobs. So um, Greg has um, added in the, chat about learning to say no to because I think sometimes we um we think we have to say yes to every opportunity and we have to remember as well that we're all fallible there's only 24 hours in each day and we're not Beyonce Beyonce's got a whole team behind her you know we only have ourselves so we have to look after our our own resources that's important you know self-care is really important as well So we're now over to you guys. If you have a question, I'm going to ask you if you could um, raise your hand. There is a raised hand icon that you will all be familiar with. That's one thing the pandemic did for us was teach us how to use, you know, these online platforms. So don't be shy. Um, Take advantage of this responsibility, of this opportunity to ask the question that brought you here. What was it you wanted to learn? What was it you wanted to find out? So I know from my discussions with people earlier that we have Christia, who has a question, and Shwetraj, um, and I know of a couple of other people too. I will name you because I'm not going to ask your question for you. So, Christia, if you're listening, I'm going to go to you first, if you would like to ask your question, please, Um, because I no longer have it in front of me. Um, If you're not ready, then anybody else who does have a question, go ahead, raise your hand um, and let me just have a look. Yeah. So, yes. Riksa uh, Wangchuk, I hope I've got your name pronounced correctly, says on the point about networking, he's recently tried using LinkedIn to reach out to alums, is genuinely interested in social development, but not receiving responses. How can he balance starting a dialogue while also remaining sensitive to their own time and space? Um, Anyone got any advice on that please excuse me serene i missed the very beginning of the question which i think Ah, yes could you would you mind so it's basically on the point about network networking he's recently tried using linkedin to reach out to alumni says he's genuinely interested in the field of social development but not receiving responses how can he balance starting a dialogue while also remaining sensitive to um, people's time and space I can go if you want um yeah this is something I've been doing um for a few years uh it sounds a bit odd but I would say insist uh, th- this is based on my experience. Um, if people do not have time, they don't reply. However, they usually take note, they remember you. So maybe they don't have time once, twice, three times, or the fourth, they, they would do. Um, I suggest that maybe you narrow down the list of people that you, you want to talk to and then you prioritize. Um, but you know what, when sometimes people say just pester, I actually do. It, it, as I said, at the end of the day, it's about people. They will decide if uh, just maybe 
if they, they will decide if they want to reply to you or not, this is what I meant. Um, a plan is really good. I'm going to get in touch with 10 people for four times, and then you see. Um, this is the best advice I can give you because it does work. I promise it does work. Thank you. So I'm just going to let you know um, that I have got Anne Mary, Christia, and Hing Tung Rachel Lim. Um, so I'll start with you, Anne Mary, if you'd like to put your hand down. Um, not sure if I can do that for you. And then go ahead and ask your question. Thank you so much. It was very, I mean, it felt very hopeful listening to all of you. So I had a question regarding the unpaid internships and the equal opportunity part. So like most of us can't really afford to go for unpaid internships. And like right now, most jobs require at least a year of experience, even if it's like an entry level job. So in such situations, like how would like people who can't afford to go for like unpaid internships, make it a point to um, make sure that they get a chance or like an opportunity to work. Like how do they put themselves out there? So I think Anne-Mary, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take um, a couple more questions um, and then we'll try and feel them all out and see if people can answer, deal with them all. So your question is about how, in this cost of living crisis, people who, you know, not all of us have daddies who pay our bills. How can people afford to take unpaid internships? So thank you for that. Um, Christia, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yes, hi, um, good afternoon. Um, my question would be, um, given the situation with international students here in London, what advice can you give um, when applying for global development jobs because we're only under the tier four visa and we're very limited with that and are there sponsorship for students who want to apply for jobs in global development that's it thank you great question Christia thank you um Hing Tang Rachel do you want to I hope I've got your name correctly please feel free to go ahead and correct me if I'm mashing that up don't want to insult you um please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a your question no worries I usually go by Rachel anyway okay. um, <laughs> uh so I was wondering if you guys were always considering staying in more academia focused careers um I think, because uh, I'm really struggling with the push and pull of that. I'm not exactly the most academically orientated, but the thought of also working for anything finance or banking related kind of kills my soul. And I know this is like, it's not exactly one or the other, and there's a lot of things in between, but I was wondering if for you guys, uh, your path was always, even though it might not be the most concrete, it, it, you guys were always more curious and knew you guys want to pursue something uh, along the lines of what you guys have always uh, done. Oh, well, funny you should ask, because actually how I found Alina is because I fangirl over one of her colleagues called Kerry Wong. So I ch always check her Twitter and so on. I saw that she did um, a podcast with Alina about academia to stay or to go. So I'm just... Um, mentioning that while trying not to throw various Alinas under any buses. Um, so um, I don't know if we want to start with that. And again, anybody can come in on, on that question for Rachel, if you have any advice there. But um, Alina, thank you for unmuting. <sighs> uh, yeah, I can start. I mean, I didn't tell you guys. I mean, like the others went all the way what they wanted to do at school. Like I didn't go down that far, but I did in my degree in economics. My undergraduate was in economics. I hated it and I hated economics. I finished it, but I had a course on demography and I felt like, wow, this is interesting. This is about people. It's about humans that makes a difference. I couldn't care less about 
marketing and investment banking. This is where the majority of my friends work. This is just it. And or they do PhD in, in economics and they went to like MIT and Harvard and they do hardcore macro micro. So I very much can relate to, you know, what is the passion and um also i did grow up in moscow so i also as i wanted to say uh i do share all the pain of getting the visas and like not in you know like eligible for quite a lot of stuff so luckily you know i did my degree when in the beautiful five years where rush had good international relationships obviously it would have been very different nowadays and uh but indeed, so I found a project, a program in Germany, and that's how I kind of started my academic career. I went as an exchange student for four months. It's now been 13 years. I never planned any of the things happen to me. But um, A, Germany is a country where education is cheap. So the tuition fees are very low and there are student scholarships and cost of living is low. And if you speak a little bit German, like that also helps. My program was completely in German. So luckily I was able to, to comprehend it. I wasn't sure. I only went as an exchange student with a scholarship. But while I was there, I learned about other scholarships. I, people told me like, look, you can apply for these bits and bobs of money. And then this pres pres professor is looking for a, a research assistant. So you can, you know, you can get your 300 euros there, 200 euros there. So you know, I funded all, like I funded myself, my education. And it was through this kind of asking around, uh, finding what you find interesting. So demography was interesting for me. And that's why I applied for a program, but I also didn't apply for any program in the world. I applied where I could fund it and where it was cheaper. And and that is a very important criteria that always used to be for me. Um, and uh, my parents never paid for my education. Um, so that is one of the things like look for programs where there are scholarships, where the internships send numerous emails to ask what are the possibility of funding um, and, you know, whether there is any paid internships with some some programs do offer internships as part of their curriculum. And um, I think especially in, in, in development in some European countries, but um, I think like that's what I wanted to say. And I stayed in academia because it was pain and it was interesting. And my professors were very supportive and they saw that I had, you know, that I enjoyed learning about what I really, you know, was interested in. Um, I wasn't that sparked by economics, but, and, and that helped. And then they were like, oh, look, I have a position here. Why don't you consider doing this? And the European Doctoral School of Demography that I mentioned came about through my classmates doing that who were one year above me and they were like look this is great they pay for it so you don't have to do a PhD if you don't like it but it's you know no one will take it away from you and you know um answering again about whether you and at the UN you need a PhD so I could have gone you know you, you can go and work at the UN without a PhD most of people that don't have PhDs uh, masters or even bachelors is uh, enough but it's very hard to go through the pool at the kind of at the starting point so a PhD is something that lifts you up a little bit above the average but people who work there most of them don't have a PhD but if you want to work with the UN if you want to be a consultant Consultants, which is very well paid and very prestigious, you got to be an expert. Like they don't hire people for consultancy who are not expert. And this is the, you know, echoing what um what Greg was saying about whether you be a generalist. You are very generalist, but who they work with are specialists. So all the guidelines and the recommendations that they produce is based on work with hardcore specialists. But people who work around it have like a general, you know, knowledge about the world. Um, I think okay. like that's. That's one thing. Um, I quickly wanted to say about the tier four visa in the UK. As far as I know from last year or the year before, it was during the pandemic, it was brought back the visa for um, for students to stay for two more years and you, you are eligible to work. I think that is back. It's called the graduate visa, as far as I know. Um, so you can apply for it and for two years, you can work in the country. It doesn't contribute to your indefinite leave to remain, but it will give you an opportunity to do either internships or short-term contracts. So you're not going to be kicked out of the country like the day you graduate. So this was my understanding. I think you need to check it, but I'm pretty sure that um, it was brought back during the pandemic. Um, okay, great. Thank you. That's practical, solid information. Does anybody have anything to add? I know I do. 
Any? Okay, I'm just going to mention here an organization that um, in my previous job I came to know about. And it's, you probably all know about it already, but it's UKISA, U-K-C-I-S-A, which I think, I, which I think stands for UK Council on International Student Affairs. They really know about all the, you know, rules and regulations um, for international students. So it's worth checking them out. And in terms of funding through my job here, I know about Find a PhD, which is um, a good place for finding out about funded PhDs. There's also the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission. Um, so if you're from a Commonwealth country, they do um, provide scholarships so check them out CSC um, then we had um, a question uh, I think it's actually already been answered we had a question from Shwetraj which was about um, sorry let me just check what it said how useful is a PhD degree when planning on working with multilateral organizations I, I think Helena you've already answered that so we have actually already gone over time, but I do want to give um, a last opportunity for anyone who wanted to ask a question and hasn't had that um, opportunity. Yet. So sorry, there's a, there's a link in the chat that Alina has very helpfully put there, gov.uk graduate hyphen visa. And then there's a question from Morna Ikosa, are there any institutions in the UK that fund African master students? So I just mentioned the Commonwealth Scholarships um, Commission. So I would check those out more now in case there's any there that are um, of use to you. Um, and does anyone have a final question that they'd like to ask before we wrap up? Can I actually add a comment on funding? Yes, please do. Um, so uh, the NGOs um, do fund PhD students as well. So it's worth checking. Um, I don't think there's a, there's one website listing all the NGOs, NGOs but if you, uh, for example, Brooke, um, the, we always fund PhD students, mainly in VET, because this is our expertise. We're currently funding um, a PhD in Ethiopia um, and absolutely fantastic actually this guy is amazing so i think it's worth checking on um specific uh, organizations as well yeah that's brilliant thank you so much valentina greg that's a final comment i think uh, yeah. is to Anne mary's uh, question around um the difficulty the catch 22 of trying to develop enough experience but you know often to get these opportunities you need experience um i don't have Fortunately, being a British person, I don't have the insight in terms of like what you might need uh, to say work in the UK, say the visa stipulations and so on. But I think applying for things like PhDs, for example, you know, if you can develop some of the like skills essentially, uh, which it, whether it may be uh, you know say something like coding or media, or whatever it may be, uh, and kind of and if it's something that you're interested in and passionate in. Um, you can develop your CV that way. Uh, it may be a compliment to if you're able to get a paid opportunity. And of course, this stuff we're talking about work life balance, this stuff, even if it is a coding language you're particularly interested in, whatever, uh, that does take time and you know, away from other, other, um, other things you may be doing. But uh, yeah, just you know, developing those skills and, and trying to set yourself apart um, in, in that way, um, yeah, that, that, is, that is super valuable. But yeah, it was a really good question. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Greg. And also languages. Um, yeah, particularly those of us that grew up with a different language. Once you've got one language, it's easier to learn other languages. And I've never met anyone who said, oh, I wish I didn't know all these languages. <laughs> like, who says that? <laughs> um, so... Right, it's 10 to 5 British summer time. There's even a little bit of blue sky out there. Thank you all so much. I know how busy everyone is. This technology has just doubled our workload. It was meant to help us when they first brought it in. 
as someone who learned how to type on a manual typewriter. Jesus, I miss those days. <sighs> anyway, the past has gone. Thank you so much to our panel. You've really covered more than I was even hoping that you would. Thank you to my colleagues in the Action Against Stunting Hub. I know that you've had an event today earlier, and I also know how taxing putting on events is. So the fact that you did that and then left that and then came here, really appreciated. Love the solidarity. Thank you to my LIDC colleague, Natalia, for being here and for helping. And thank you to you, the students, because without you, what would I have done this afternoon? I got to see you all, well, some of you, I got to see See some of you hear what you're interested in please keep in touch with us i put the link to our event next week um in the chat but it's on our events page and i'll be putting on more events as well thank you for the inspiration because you haven't inspired just our students you've inspired us who are a bit longer in the tooth as well. So I really needed that energy and I'm very grateful and um, hope you all have a really fantastic rest of the week. And I hope I get to work with you all again soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Oh, and we will put the, um, the recording up on our YouTube as soon as we can and we'll let you know when that goes up. So yeah, thank you, take care, good afternoon, goodbye.